Good evening, everyone. I'm Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind presentation on ADHD. We'd like to begin by welcoming our guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, who is a professor of psychology at the University of California at Berkeley, cousin of UCLA, and the author of The ADHD Explosion, and also the director of the Hinshaw Lab at the University of Berkeley. So thank you very much, Dr. Hinshaw, for coming from Northern California to be with us this evening and to educate us all about ADHD. Also with us this evening is Dr. Tara Paris. She is a friend scholar, which she will tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. She is also an assistant professor of psychology here at UCLA, and she her work is in evidence-based treatment for child and adolescent anxiety disorders. Um, Dr. Paris will be introducing Dr. Hinshaw in just a moment, and she actually was his student at UC Berkeley, so we're very excited to have student and mentor here at our ADHD event. Um, also with us this evening is Dr. Andrew Luchter, who is a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences here at UCLA. He is also lucky for us, a faculty advisor to the Friends of the Semmel Institute, and he will be moderating the question and answer portion of this evening's program, which will immediately follow Dr. Hinshaw's presentation. Um, you will be receiving uh, index cards that you can write your questions on, um, and then uh, if you pass them to the aisle, they'll be collected, and Dr. Luchter will moderate the questions. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, this evening for being here and sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. Um, so I know that most of you know that the Friends of the Semmel Institute is the support group for the world-renowned Semmel Institute, which is one of the leading centers for the study of the mind, brain, and behavior. The Friends of the Semmel Institute, uh, we sponsor the Open Mind, and at our first Open Mind in October, we began a new program, and that is to make 100 new friends. So please allow me to explain. We function very much like public radio or a public television station in that if you feel that the service that we are providing to the community is important and that you would like to see more programs like the one that you are here for this evening, we hope that you will join us as friends of the friends or members of the friends. I'm very excited to say that since October, we are 25% of the way toward our goal. We have made 25 new friends. And I'd like to tell you what 100 new friends would allow us to do. We could fund 12 to 15 friends travel grants. These are grants that are given to postdoctoral fellows and junior faculty to travel to professional conferences to present their state-of-the-art research. This leads to collaborations with colleagues from all over the world. We could fund more Friends scholars, like Dr. Paris, who you will meet in just a moment. Um, these scholars are the best and brightest here at the Semmel Institute, and we are very proud to be able to support their research. These are scholar grants that are $50,000 for one year of research and very competitive grants. And I'm very proud to say that we have four friend scholars here with us this evening, and I'd like them to stand. Dr. Tara Paris, Dr. Erin Kelly, Dr. Philippe Jane, and Dr. Mary O'Shea. Let's give these wonderful young people a round of applause. The other thing we could do is have more open mind presentations, like the one that you are here for this evening. Since we began this program in 2006, we've sponsored over 40 open mind events. 
And actually, these programs began in my living room and moved to other board members' living rooms until they just became too big. There was just too much interest and too, and too many people wanted to come and hear these presentations. So we moved them to UCLA and named them The Open Mind. I hope that you will support us. Um, you can pick up an envelope on your way out this evening or visit our website, friendswithsemmelinstitute.org, where you will find information about our programs, a secure donation site, and also information about our Great Minds Gala, which will be held on April 19th at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. We will be honoring UCLA Chancellor Jean Block, Congressman Patrick Kennedy, and Homeland producers and writers Howard Gordon and Alex Ganza. So we're very excited about this, and all the proceeds go to fund our Friends Scholar Program. So now please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Tara Paris. Thank you so much. Good evening. It is a pleasure and a privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Stephen Hinshaw. As Vicki mentioned, Dr. Hinshaw is an international expert in ADHD, and he has been the lead investigator on some of the most groundbreaking work in the field, including research aimed at understanding which treatments work best for ADHD and how the condition manifests in girls and young women. As Vicki mentioned, uh, before I go on to tell you about Dr. Hinshaw's many contributions to the field, I've been asked to speak a bit about my own research. In addition to seeking out leading scholars in art and neuroscience, psychology and psychiatry for this Open Mind series, the Friends of the Semmel Institute also devote considerable resources to supporting the next generation of researchers. And as she mentioned, I am one of this year's grant recipients. My research focuses on tr developing treatments for child and adolescent anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders are among the most common mental health conditions affecting children and adolescents, and it's estimated that by the time they reach age 18, somewhere between 20 and 25% of youth will meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. So that's a staggering number of kids, and I'm interested in understanding how these conditions develop, and more importantly, in what we can do to treat them. Through my funding from the Friends of the Semmel Institute, I've been using neuroimaging techniques to look at how specific components of our current gold standard talk therapy, a particular approach called cognitive behavior therapy, um, how these specific treatment techniques work their effects in the brain. And I'm interested in understanding where and how they work with the goal of developing more targeted interventions. I'm also interested in exploring how these treatment techniques may differ in their effectiveness over the course of development, such that children and adolescents may respond differently. Through conducting this work, my hope is to develop more effective and more durable treatments and to identify time points for early intervention with anxiety disorders. I'm not the only friend scholar, as Vicki mentioned. Uh, I want to point out that the many others who stood with me are doing incredibly impressive, innovative, high impact work, and work that simply wouldn't be possible without their generous grant support. Um, neuroimaging research in particular is incredibly costly, and it's just, um, it's a bit out of reach for an early career investigator. So we are grateful for your support and for all you do to support us. Now you are all here to um, hear Dr. Hinshaw speak on his new book, The ADHD Explosion. So I will tell you a bit about his many accomplishments. Dr. Hinshaw completed his undergraduate studies at Harvard University, where he graduated summa cum laude, before coming here to UCLA to complete his doctoral studies and pre-doctoral internship. He then went on to take a faculty position at UC Berkeley, where he has remained ever since. He is currently a professor of psychology former chair of the Department of Psychology, and a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and vice chair of psychology and psychiatry at UCSF. He is also the editor in chief of Psychological Bulletin, one of the most high impact journals in the field, and the author of over 240 publications and 14 books. 
He has been named one of the top 10 most productive scholars in clinical psychology, and he was recently named a distinguished, uh, given the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Society for the Science of Clinical Psychology. I hope you will join me in giving him a warm welcome this evening. I'm honored to be here. This is where I did my graduate work. I was a professor here for a couple of years before heading up to Berkeley, and uh, Covell Commons didn't exist when I was here before. This whole side of campus is brand new. So we've got a lot to talk about, and I don't want to delay. And we're going to start by showing some advertisements for ADHD medications. Now, I can do this under what's called fair use. So I don't work for pharma and I'm not selling medications, but as we do in this book, The ADHD Explosion, we take a look at a few ads to see what they're signifying about the marketplace and what ADHD signifies. And I'd like you to think about whether these ads are great anti-stigma devices or whether it's a marketplace that's gone awry. The, the reason we can see these ads is that FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, changed their guidelines in 97 and 99, so that only two countries on the planet now allow direct-to-consumer ads for the general public, the United States and New Zealand. Every other country has a lot of advertisements for doctors, which you can see if you go to any medical journal. So does this create a fair marketplace, more competition, lower prices, reduce stigma, because everybody's talking about it, or is it actually not a fair marketplace? We could talk about that later in question and answers. But So the first ad we're seeing is for Concerted. This is a product that was the first really effective long-acting stimulant. It take it in the morning and it lasts pretty much a whole school day, maybe into the late afternoon hours. And we can see that the smiling mother is looking into sort of the near distance and her son Jason is here smiling too. And it's quite interesting because when Jason is medicated, Mom sees Jason, not his annoying symptoms. So I do a little sort of study of advertisements to see what messages they give. To me, it's not doesn't label itself this way, but this is the first ADHD medication ad that is really an anti-stigma message. If you medicate your kid, you'll see your true kid and have a better relationship and not these annoying symptoms that get in the way. So in some ways, it's a very powerful message, whether true or not. We'll talk about medications a little bit later. What's the biggest market today for ADHD medications? Adults, by far. The kid market has kind of plateaued. About 70% of kids with a diagnosis today get medication, but adults, especially adult women, are growing it at really fast rates. So here's an ad for another long-acting product, Adderall XR, and you can't really see, but in the fine print on both panels here are citations to the psychiatric literature that if you have ADHD, high likelihood of having comorbid depression, high likelihood, much higher than the norm, of getting divorced. So these speak to the impairments, comorbidities, impairments that might accrue from a history of ADHD, really tapping into this adult market. That's pretty powerful messages. And here's the third one we'll look at today. Who is this? This is Shane Victorino, the first Hawaiian American to play Major League Baseball earned his first World Series ring with the Phillies, 2009, then with the Red Sox a year ago, but of course the San Francisco Giants are the world champions, and the Red Sox were in last place this year. So that's what happens in sports. And this ad is sponsored by one uh, pharma company and two national support groups for ADHD. And so why is Shane in this? And there's a YouTube video and a lot of supporting material. Because unless he says, I've got ADHD, he can't take stimulants to play Major League Baseball. Unless you get an exemption, it's like taking a steroid. You'd be thrown out. Now, I don't know what your feelings are about baseball. I'm more of a sort of basketball and football guy. <laughs> baseball, in some ways, is the world's most boring sport. <laughs> Unless you're in right field in the ninth inning and the line drives coming to you like Hunter Pence did in many occasions or you're waiting for that curve ball, but it's really a screw ball, and you have to have focus in the moment after hours of doing very little. What's interesting is that there are two and a half times 
as more Major League Baseball players that have exemptions for ADHD to take stimulants as Major League Football or basketball players. Now, it might be that the actual prevalence of adult ADHD is two and a half times higher in baseball, or are people gaming the system to get a performance enhancer? And this is a lot of the controversy about ADHD these days. Is it a real diagnosis? Is it really impairing? Can we localize regions in the brain? Or is it becoming an excuse to give kids and teens and adults a performance edge? And we'll come back at the very end and talk about what I think is the biggest problem today is the use of ADHD medications by people who don't have ADHD, called diversion, smart pills, right? Neuroenhancement. So we'll come back to that. So ADHD is in the news all the time. I mentioned this briefly at the, the talk at Semmel this morning. We know the cause of it every couple of years, and the cause was found in 2011 to be SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> and this was a very serious study by Angeline Lillard, our colleague at Virginia, a developmental psychologist, who randomly assigned four-year-olds to watch nine minutes of SpongeBob, nine minutes of a public television nature show, or free play for nine minutes, and then gave a mini executive function battery, how well could the kids inhibit an impulse and show working memory immediately after. And the kids who'd watched SpongeBob didn't do very well. They did significantly worse than the other two groups. Now those of you who have kids young enough know it really isn't SpongeBob, it's Patrick, his buddy, that's really the cause of these problems. But this is a pre prevalent idea these days that we all are gaining attention deficits because of the fast-paced media and because of 500 or 5,000 stations and because of social media growing before our eyes. There's a lot of interesting data about whether ADHD is linked to starting kindergarten early. Just before or just after that cutoff, whatever it is in the particular district, the kids who start early at age four are about 35 to 40 percent more likely to receive a diagnosis at the end of the school year in several U.S. states and in the entire province of British Columbia. Now one of the reasons is, I think, a big theme of this talk, how do most of these kids get diagnosed? In a 10 to 12 minute visit with a pediatrician with no rating scales, no school observations, no thorough history to rule out trauma or the many other conditions that can mimic ADHD. It's way too easy to diagnose this condition these days. This also raises the point that maybe kids with ADHD are just immature. And if you stay tuned, in a few minutes we'll talk about brain immaturity as being a potential actual cause. Uh, we're not going to talk much about the side effects of stimulants right now. They do raise the pulse and blood pressure. So is this a public health threat that too many stimulants would cause people to have heart attacks? The most prevalent data now suggests that it's not really above chance rates, but it is a concern. If you want to get the wrong message about ADHD, read the New York Times. <laughs> the news stories are pretty good. They're mixed. Alan Schwartz has done a series just one the other day, but the opinion pieces and the Sunday review pieces, it's, it's as though you're uh, awakened in 1948 or 1957. ADHD is caused by bad parenting. As the playwright Kuryeshi said, medicating a kid for ADHD when a parent decides this is like binding the kid's hands so he or she can't masturbate. It's for the pleasure of the parents and society, depriving the kid of rights. You, you, you'd think the Inquir National Enquirer would publish this stuff, not the Times. So very different opinions about PTSD and depression and bipolar disorder than about ADHD in the opinion pieces and the op-eds in the Times. David Brooks uh, did a particularly nasty job about ADHD in 2013. It makes you wonder if somebody high on the editorial board had a kid or relative that was overdiagnosed or overtreated. But this isn't helping the cause of really helping those people who have a condition that needs treatment. So this is the book that's in the back. My colleague Richard Scheffler is a health economist. It's really a good idea to pair up with people outside your sweet spot, to pair up with people who do incredible things with data at an economic perspective. And through this kind of collaborative work, I've learned a lot, and we hope that we have a different perspective than just the clinical one on what ADHD is. And we'll hear about that a little bit later. So in fact, one of the words in the subtitle of the book is myths, we're trying to debunk myths. Actually, ADHD 
has a very high genetic liability, almost as high as that of autism or bipolar disorder. It really does exist, and the genetic uh, liability is huge. ADHD really does cost, for kids, beyond the immediate effects of treatment, $100 billion to society last year. And for adults, closer to $200 billion in lost wages and productivity and job instability. So this is a costly disorder. It's not just annoying kids uh, in classrooms that aren't, aren't totally responsive. So is ADHD, however, a hidden gift? Which many people will tell you. A lot of spark, energy, creativity. Ned Hallowell, who's written a lot about the topic, coined a good phrase. He said, yeah, ADHD might be a gift, but if it is, it's really hard to unwrap that gift because there's a lot of problems in getting people with ADHD to work up to their potential. So the idea that it's just a mean societal label to squelch creativity is misguided. A lot of people with ADHD do a lot better if they do get engaged in treatment. So we think too many of us that medications are poisons, these stimulants should never be given, they're neurotoxins. In fact, the biggest effect size in all of psychiatry is stimulant medications for kids with ADHD. About 80% respond versus 15% on placebo. But the counterpoint myth is, well, that's all you need to do is give these kids medication and they're fine. There's some children up in the Bay Area who do great on medications. They don't really have any comorbid disorders. They only have mild academic impairments. And actually, both of those children are doing very well in Northern <laughs> California. But everybody else needs a lot of multimodal intervention, which is a big theme that we'll, we'll talk more about in question and answer. And I mentioned before, but I want to just have a slide point on it. Too many diagnoses are being given in a very brief pediatric visit, or for adults with a general practitioner. When you have a big research grant, you can spend many hours. But there are systems, and I've consulted with Kaiser in Northern California, to get parent and teacher ratings before that first visit, to do histories, to have groups of kids come together, to extend the assessment. We owe it to ourselves and to the people we're trying to help to train and then reimburse evidence-based assessments. Otherwise, ADHD is in some ways deserving of some of the stigma it's now getting as just an excuse or a cop-out. So talked about the impairment academically and vocationally. Kids with ADHD also tend to be less liked than autistic kids, anxious kids, kids with delinquency. Kids with ADHD tend to do interesting things, like blow out the birthday candles at a party, but it's not their birthday. It's another kid's party. And if you can't restrain that impulse, because you look like a pretty well put together kid, and what the heck was that all about? Because it's unexpected. So the impulse control problems and the lack of regulation lead to peer rejection. Still today, if you had to pick one assessment of a second grader to predict school dropout, delinquency, or the need of pretty serious mental health services by 30, what would it be? A psychological test, a medical exam, an educational test? No, it'd be whether the second grade classmates consistently say, I don't want to be friends with that kid. Peer rejection is the single biggest predictor. Now, it means two things. First, we should be hiring second graders on our assessment teams. They're a good source of information. But also, independent of that, the act of being rejected by your peers effectively expels you from the peer group. Be like being expelled from school and trying to learn. Without those social connections, these kids are at a huge disadvantage to learn socially, which is usually done through peers. We'll talk in a minute more about fa family dynamics and ADHD, but I want to mention at the bottom accidental injury. Kids with ADHD symptoms that are high before the age of five are about four times more likely to die than other kids because they swallow poisons and get hit by cars, and they jump from high places. And 16 and above, as our colleague Russ Barkley knows, because he got the DMV in Massachusetts when he taught at the medical center, to embed an ADHD checklist into the DMV registry. So for millions of Massachusetts drivers, you got ADHD symptom histories, five times the rate of serious motor vehicle accidents and fatalities. And Russ's fraternal twin brother, Russ Barkley is a big ADHD researcher, died a few years ago in a single car accident without wearing a seatbelt speeding. 
So this is a highly impairing condition. You think it's just bothersome behavior in a classroom, but many kids with ADHD develop head injuries from their accidental injuries, which then compound the symptoms, and now you've got a neurological and a psychiatric syndrome wrapped into one. ADHD only exists in the United States, right? <laughs> Wrong. Where does it exist? In every nation that has a key feature, compulsory education. If you make kids go to school, which we only started doing about a century and a half ago, this reveals these genetically mediated tendencies that some kids have to not focus very well and to be pretty impulsive. In fact, what's remarkable through Palenzik's meta-analytic meta-regressions, 2007, 2012, is that the point prevalence of ADHD around the world is very close to 5% of school kids in countries with compulsory education. It's the United States that's double. So we're the outlier. But it's a mistake to say, well, it's just an American phenomenon. And the other countries are fairly quickly catching up with US in terms of medication rates, which we could certainly talk about later, too. So what is ADHD? We want to do a little more detail this morning. It's an attention deficit. It's an executive function deficit. It's an inhibitory control deficit where you can't really quick, remember quick enough that it's not your birthday and there's those exciting candles. And in many ways, it's a motivational deficit where the reward pathways in the brain, way beneath our cortex, seem to be underactivated in terms of dopamine. This is why the stimulants probably provide a, a particular benefit. And so our colleague over in the UK, Edmund Sanuga Bark, says part of it is the frontal lobes top-down controlling lower brain regions. There's also bottom-up. If you don't have these reward incentive pathways lit up, you're going to have problems. And time management and other executive functions are also a contributor. So you can think of some kids with top-down and bottom-up and executive deficits. ADHD is a multifaceted point on a continuum. You don't either have it or you don't. You exist on a bell curve. And at some point, we say the symptoms and impairments are high enough. We probably should give a diagnosis. So the old name for ADHD in the 40s and 50s from factor analyses was it was called the immaturity factor or the immaturity syndrome. These are kids who act young. Now, that name has sort of bypassed us. But Philip Shaw and his colleagues in Bethesda at the National Institutes of Health have done the world's first longitudinal neuroimaging study, 237 kids with ADHD, 237 match controls, coming back every year or two to get their brain scanned. The frontal cortex right up here, this thin layer, cortex in Greek is bark, so the coating of the brain, reaches its maximum thickness in most typically developing kids, right about six, six and a half. And in the ADHD sample, this is delayed by three to three and a half years. This pattern continues on into adolescence when normatively the cortex thins and prunes again, the way it did in the first couple of years in life, sort of its second pruning. And the kids with ADHD that are now teens are still delayed by about three years. And you can correlate the size, at a given age, of the cortex with the symptoms they show across the next year. So there's a neural underpinning for at least a subset of people with ADHD. We don't know, again, if this is a specific genetic program or there's some epigenetic forces that are not signaling the brain in the right way to do its frontal maturation. ADHD runs in genes in families not so much in family environments. It's very heritable. So the mistake people make is to say, well, if genes really underlie it, there's nothing much we can do. We can maybe give medications, or even Russ Barkley, our colleague, sometimes says, well, parents are just kind of shepherds. Just make sure that they don't stray too far, which actually betrays the laws of behavioral genetics. Even extremely heritable or completely heritable conditions can be controlled through environmental means, which if we had more time, we'd get in discussion of some of these counterexamples. So it's a mistake to think that, well, ADHD has a high genetic liability. Therefore, there's really not much families or peer groups or schools can do. That's really nonsense. There's 
everything that they can do to really help make a clinical difference. So which genes? Sort of the modern history of psychiatric genetics. Not that many years ago, we thought we'd nailed a few key genes that predict how many receptors for dopamine you have, or how much dopamine is transported back into the presynaptic neuron. Each one of those genes we now know explains a tiny fraction of ADHD-ness. The modern international psychiatric consortia in genetics are showing now something fascinating that the same genes that underlie risk for schizophrenia, mood disorders, autism, and ADHD are in fact the same genes that have to do with basic brain building processes. Obviously, the symptoms of these disorders are quite disparate, so it must be that some vulnerabilities at a very basic level to brain development are being played out over time in terms of the intrauterine environment, the early environment, and later environments. The more we know, the less we know that there's a single gene for any psychiatric condition. Very quickly, if you're born at a low birth weight, that predicts ADHD. It predicts Tourette's disorder, predicts learning disorders. It doesn't predict conduct problems and mood and anxiety disorders. It predicts learning and motor problems. If you're born early at a low weight, until about the sixth or seventh month of development, there's only one big main artery that comes from below into these areas that subserve learning and memory. And if you get hemorrhaging into the brain, this sets the stage for later ADHD. One of the reasons for the ADHD explosion is that compared to 30 years ago, many more very low and extremely low birth weight babies are surviving. And so many of these kids develop ADHD. So this would be one reason for an increase in the actual prevalence, not just what we call the diagnosed prevalence or some of these crummy assessments falsely labeling kids. If you're a mom and you're pregnant and you drink a lot, you have a kid with fetal alcohol syndrome. If you drink some, and we don't know what some means, kids are likely to develop what are called fetal alcohol effects. And what are fetal alcohol effects? Inattention, impulsivity, hyperactivity, learning problems, and aggression. So the symptoms that we're talking about, even though there may be genetic vulnerability, are fueled by alcohol as a teratogen in utero. Smoking is a risk factor in utero or even exposure to secondhand smoke for ADHD and aggressive conduct problems. So there's a lot of factors here. There's no good evidence that how you're parented, or certainly if you're securely attached as an infant, that doesn't really predict later ADHD, but it predicts severe mood disorders and severe aggression a lot. So this might explain why some kids with ADHD tend to develop pretty serious comorbid problems. So in our textbook and in your continuing ed quizzes that you must pass to leave the room, you need to know two terms equifinality, there may be many roads that lead to Rome. What looks like a kid, a teen, an adult with ADHD might in some cases have been the product of an inherited pattern of certain dopamine genes. In other cases, low birth weight. In other cases, severe deprivation as in the Eastern European orphanages. What's the most common behavioral outcome of kids who've survived that severe deprivation their first couple of years of life? Inattention and overactivity. But usually paired with very severe attachment disruptions. So many pathways might converge on what looks like ADHD. Similarly, you can take difficult temperament, which some of these kids have, or ADHD as a diagnosis, and there's not just one outcome, there's many outcomes. Resilience can occur. Treatment is a big factor that explains the fanning out under what we call multifinality. Just because you have a risk doesn't mean you're doomed to a difficult outcome. So these are two important terms. So parents, as we just said, don't look to be the primary cause of ADHD symptoms. But if you have a three-year-old who gave up naps at 11 months and is now in his third preschool, wakes up at five, pulls down the curtains in the house, is a threat to sister and pets, you probably tend to fight fire with fire. So if parents are likely to get into coercive chains of discipline. 
too lax sometimes and then too harsh at other times in this kind of mix that's not productive parenting. Now, what do we also know? If ADHD has these heritability statistics as high as I've mentioned, what's true of about 40 to 50 percent of biological parents of kids with ADHD? They've got the symptoms too, whether diagnosed or not. If you want to do good parent training for a family of a kid with ADHD, what you're essentially trying to do is make that parent a super parent. Always consistent, not screaming, the reward or the punishment comes through very clearly. But if you're not very organized yourself, and if you've got emotional dysregulation, this is hard to do. So one of the big questions these days is, do parents themselves need treatment for their depression or ADHD before they can really become good parent managers. And there's some good research on the East Coast that's looking at trying to supplement good old traditional behavioral parent training, which is very effective with these kids, but supplement it with treating the parents at the same time for couples communication and for depression and their own ADHD symptoms. So we did a study a long time ago and this got published in Child Development, which is a big journal of normative development. And they usually don't put anything in there about ADHD, which they would consider too clinical and too applied. So we'd been conducting a series of camps, starting at UCLA, then up in Berkeley. This is for boys with ADHD. And in this particular study, we were trying to predict who was well liked by his peers by the end of the program, trying to predict something good for once, not a negative outcome. We had a lot of variables to put in the equation, and we put in a variable to measure parenting through a parent self-report checklist. What's the worst way in history to measure parenting? Parent self-report checklist. <laughs> in my checklist, for example, I have always delivered rewards to my three boys, have never raised my voice, and have always <laughs> delivered them to activities on time. You can see my scores on my checklist. The ideas about parenting scale, Diana Baumrin helped contribute to this up at Berkeley, was designed as one that it's hard to fake good answers on. And the classic notion is that we might be able to see from self-report as well as observation <laughs> those parents who are authoritative in their parenting. So on the horizontal axis is warmth and responsiveness. Across every culture studied, parents vary. Some parents didn't really want to be parents, some parents just love it. And on the vertical axis is the amount of control you show as a parent. Some parents are, frankly, Berkeley in the 60s, everything goes, and some parents are very structured. The ideal in most research is the upper right quadrant where you've got the, the right balance of you love being a parent, and your kid knows that you dig being a parent, but you're not afraid to set limits. So in classic authoritative parenting, you're high in warmth, you're high in control, and you also do two other things. You push your kid toward autonomy, and you reason with your kid about misbehavior, not right after they've misbehaved, but during neutral moments. So it's not just uh, authoritarian, there's some rationale for why parents are doing what they're doing. So across many summer camps for boys, we gave these scales, and lo and behold, the parents of the non-ADHD, the control group who'd come to these camps, scored way higher on this authoritative factor than the primary parents, usually mothers, of the ADHD group. The ADHD group would sometimes write in the margins on the questionnaires, warmth, we haven't had a pleasant interaction in five years. <laughs> Homework is a nightly battle. High expectations, we just want them to survive through high school. And this is serious business. So, but key point in research is variance. There was just as much variability in the responses of the parents of the ADHD boys as in the comparison group. Some of those parents of the boys with ADHD scored just as high, if not higher, than the parents of the typically developing kids. So what we did was try to again predict who was socially competent, who really developed good relationships at the summer camp. We put all sorts of things in the equation, daily observations of aggressive behavior, prosocial behavior, internalizing behavior. We found one significant predictor in the whole study. Did the primary parent 
have a high authoritative parenting score. Now, we failed to do one thing in this study, which was to randomly assign these boys at birth to live in different households for the next 15 <laughs> years. We, the, both UCLA and Berkeley's IRB panels had a little trouble with that. But these findings held just as much in our step and adoptive families as in our biological families. There's a suggestion that really good parenting may boost social competence in these kids. And also, this prediction really only held up for the boys with ADHD. In the comparison group, there's a lot of reasons why these boys develop friendships. But for the boys with ADHD, having that parent really do that authoritative parenting seemed to provide a boost. And we now know from studies just published last year over in the UK, a massive adoption study over there, the Avon study, that the same thing happens in families where there's no biological relatedness between parent and kid in adoptees. So in adoptive families, the kid's behavior drives the parents reasonably crazy, and they start to use controlling, coercive discipline. And that level of discipline predicts the ADHD symptoms five years later, just the way you might find in a biological family. So those people who say it's all in the genes are wrong. These family dynamics may not cause the symptoms at age one, two, and three, but they perpetuate them and they, they're malleable. You can change parenting and change kids' behavior. How quickly do kids with ADHD get disliked by their peer group? Drew Earhart was the first doctoral student I worked with at UCLA. We ran a summer camp just down the street at Fernal Child Study Center back 20 some years ago. And he found the answer. It took the first morning of the first day of summer camp. <laughs> so we got observations running the first morning of the first day. We had to have numbers on the kids' t-shirts so the observers could know who was who, observing every, every few minutes what the kids were doing. And then that first afternoon, we had all the kids with big picture boards of who was who, because not everybody knew everybody's name. Who are the three kids you really like best in your classroom? Who are the three kids you really don't want to play with? And we've repeated those assessments a couple of times a week. By the afternoon of the first day, the boys with ADHD were five times more likely to be disliked by their peer group. So it took essentially the morning baseball game and snack uh, and reading period and lunch. The problem was that when we correlated that first day's peer rejection and the third day's with what six weeks later the boys on their sort of final sociometric appraisal over the whole camp, who's your good friend, who do you not want to play with, the correlation was 0.7 between the first day and six weeks later. As we all know from our own peer groups, it's hard to overcome a negative reputation. You start to get viewed in light of, yeah, that person's like that, not like this. So a treatment implication is if you've got a kid with ADHD who's doing well on medication, don't do what some doctors say to do, which is let's start the school year med free. Let's see how long it takes her to fail. If you've got a behavioral program, a good chart going at home, and a good daily report card going on between home and school, don't start the school year and say, well, let's not kick this in gear until November. It's late in the game. If treatments are working, give your kid a fighting chance at the beginning. So the second question in Drew's dissertation study, published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology was, okay, so why did these reputations develop so quickly? We measured lots of things, the boys' IQ and their reading and math scores and how fast they could run a 40-yard dash and how we took pictures of them, had undergraduates rate, how attractive they were. All the things that predict popularity didn't do anything in this sample. There was one variable that explained 50% of the variation in that early peer rejection, which is the highest rate of anything our team has ever predicted. How aggressively did you behave that first day? Because kids with ADHD, when they're aggressive, are usually pretty impulsive. So I will sometimes say tongue in cheek to parent groups, if you want your, and this is for boys with ADHD, probably more so, more so for girls, if you want your child to be rejected early on in their program, make sure, sure they argue with the ump after that called third strike. 
make sure that they throw spitballs at the teacher and that they swear back when kids tease them. We need to teach these kids responses to the vicissitudes of life because those reputations form early and they persist. What about girls with ADHD? We started 20 years ago what's now the largest sample of girls with ADHD in the world because when I was a grad student and beyond, people said, girls really don't get this, <laughs> all right? Not true. So we call this study the BGAL study, the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study. We published results after our summer programs. Tara worked at those programs, collected interesting data on families. And we found that just like boys with ADHD, these girls were not doing well in school. They were even more rejected by their peer group than the boys had been in their own programs. Because if you're a girl with ADHD, other girls don't like those impulsive acts. They got referred for special ed. They had all sorts of executive function problems. And we published our initial results 12 years ago. We also then started with a new grant, a five-year follow-up. We've done another five-year follow-up, and we're now in our 15th year. Over time, the girls with ADHD maintained a lot of these difficulties, even though more than half of them now don't meet criteria for ADHD. They're growing out of their symptoms, but not their impairments. They've also got one thing that's devastating that no male follow-up sample has ever found. We started asking questions in our 10-year follow-up a few years ago about self-injurious behavior. So those girls who were diagnosed back when they were girls with the combined form of ADHD, they're very impulsive as well as inattentive. 23% had made a serious suicide attempt by age 20. 8% of our inattentive group, 6% of our normal controls. That's the national average for teen suicide attempts for girls now. So the 6% is in some aberration in Northern California but four times higher in those girls, not with pure inattention, but with the impulsive form of ADHD. And then the other graph is what we call sometimes NSSI, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, cutting, burning, self-mutilation. These horrible ways of expressing deep pain where the intent's not to kill yourself, but the intent is to find some way of regulating these horrible emotions through very destructive means. 51% of the young women with these histories of early combined form ADHD were moderately to severely self-mutilating. About a quarter of the inattentive group and fully 19% of our comparison group, which is about the national average. We have a consultant to our study, Matthew Nock, professor at Harvard, MacArthur Genius winner, who's really the world's expert in self-injury. And if you look at his epidemiological data in this country and around the world, if you haven't noticed, cutting and self-injury is an epidemic in teens and especially among girls. But if you've got early ADHD, the risk is really magnified. What explains this? When you're a teenager at our five-year follow-up, what explains the development of this cutting and self-mutilatory behavior is if your parents and teachers say you're on the delinquent track and if you can't restrain your impulses. This is something called the cancel underline task, an old school neuropsychological test that really measures how well you can inhibit your impulses. But if you want to predict the severity of and actually the frequency of suicide attempts, during adolescence, it's the parent and teacher's and child's own reports of her anxiety, depression, and social withdrawal. So the internalizations predicting to suicide attempt and the externalization and these response inhibition deficits are predicting to the other forms, the devastating forms of self-injurious behavior. We also know from a very extensive study we've done, we went back for all of the girls in our sample and went through all their charts and coded rigorously for, with people blinded to who was in the ADHD and comparison group, physical and sexual abuse and neglect when they were kids and teens. The girls with ADHD were more likely to be traumatized, not surprisingly, but the subgroup of those girls with ADHD with early extensive trauma histories 
now the rate of suicide attempt was up to 38, 39%. So if you have these neurological, if you will, genetically mediated symptoms of ADHD and you've heard, had an early trauma history, the risk of devastating the ultimate form of self-injury where you want to die and you make an attempt is now uh, about two-fifths of the sample. We also have found that if during your teen years other kids really victimize you, this is a predictor of self-injurious behavior. You can see over there. And if during your teen years you're still on the outs with the peer group, that remember the way the boys were at their first day of summer camp, this is a predictor of attempted suicide. So there's a lot of pathways, sadly, for girls with ADHD to show internalization and feeling their life isn't worth living and taking it out against themselves more than boys, which is a particular risk that I think we have to pay real attention to in looking at sex differences. So if you've been alert, ADHD is not a box in the DSM. It's a very dynamic thing. There's equifinality, different causal pathways. Early ADHD can lead to very difficult outcomes, but not always. We're searching in our samples and in many others for predictors of doing well in resilience. Getting along with your friends is something that is beyond medication treatment. Medications can help. We need to teach academic and social skills. And again, as heritable as this condition is, it's the context you're in that matters. So we're going to wrap up with a little diversion into policy. And we're going to look at this ADHD explosion, which is why we titled the book this way. Centers for Disease Control now cares about ADHD. So they've added questions to this big national survey of parents. It's repeated every four or five years. 100,000 families are random phone dialed. So it's not a clinical sample. This is a representative sample. So in 2003, just 11 years ago, under 8% of families in the U.S. said, yeah, we've got a kid in our household that's been diagnosed with ADHD. A professional told us or made this diagnosis. That number jumped to 9.5% in 2007, and it's now at 11%. So that's a 41% increase in nine years. Now, if you're a boy, you've got a higher rate. And if you're a boy over the age of nine across the country, it's one boy in five who's been diagnosed. So this is going up fast. About 70% of kids with a diagnosis get medicated. What's really interesting is how different this is state by state. So the South. If and this is actual truth, if you live in Arkansas or North Carolina and you're the parent of a boy over 11, middle school or high school, the rates of diagnosis are one in three. A third of all boys in those states have had an ADHD diagnosis, <coughs> according to the parents. And we're way behind out here in California. We're way lower. Now for medication, again, the question is, if your kids had this diagnosis, does he or she get medication? Southern states, but also the plains, up to 80%. But California, Nevada, closer to half. So what might explain this? Well, maybe it's who lives in a state, more Hispanic people in California, certainly than in Arkansas or North Carolina. That explains a little bit of the difference, because Latino, Latina families have lower rates diagnosis traditionally, but it doesn't explain the vast majority of the difference. It's not how many providers are in each state's counties. That predicts a lot of medical diagnosis, but not this. It's probably not some cultural stereotype about individualists out west and the culture of honor down south. What makes a difference is school testing policies. So we did analyses for this book. They're being published in journals right now. To make a long story short, the United States 30 years ago got really concerned about test scores. And many states started passing laws in the 80s and 90s to say, unless your district's test scores are going up, you're going to be written up in the paper or lose your funding, or like the city of Oakland a few years ago, go into receivership. You were taken over by the feds. So those test score policies 
really incentivize actual performance. Not student-teacher ratio, not the curriculum, test scores are bust. What are the states that started early with those laws, the southern states? 15 of the 17 states in the south had those laws passed by 1999-2000. Now that's correlation, it's not causation. What then happened is a natural experiment that we sort of took advantage of to see if it made a difference. So 30 states, mainly in the south, passed these laws. They've already got high rates of ADHD diagnosis. And then Bush too became president and passed No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind immediately made the remaining 20 states consequential accountability states. Unless your test scores go up, you lose federal and state funding. So that law took effect in the 2002-03 school year and that first national survey of children's health took place in 2003. That's our baseline year. So what happens in the 20 states that suddenly have this accountability versus the 30 states that had it earlier? Well, it mattered whether you were a poor kid or not. If you're within 200% of the federal poverty level, these are the public school kids that these laws really take effect for. The rate of ADHD diagnosis went up 60% in four years. In the same states, the rate of upper and middle class kids ADHD diagnosis went up 7.5%. In private schools in those states that aren't subject to these laws, there was just a national average of increase. So it looks as though what? If you are running a district and you want to get those test scores up, you are motivated to get those kids diagnosed because the treatment might help their achievement. Or, and this is where it gets insidious, in many regions, not all, if you back in the 2000s, under No Child Left Behind, got your kid, got your kid diagnosed with ADHD, your kid was pulled from the district's test score average. Because you're a special ed kid, you don't count. So there's direct motivation to diagnose kids in order to raise the scores of the group. This is happening in the context of, way too often as I mentioned before, quick and dirty cursory 10 minute evaluations. Now what happened, if you go back again to the graph, what happened 2007 and then the next survey was 2012? Well, Obama got elected. The race to the top replaced, no child left behind, and it became illegal to actually remove a child's scores from the district's mean score for special ed. So as that happened, the poorest kids in these states with these accountability laws, the rates of diagnosis start to drop. Policy matters too, just as much as genes do, just as much as families and peer groups do, if we're talking about the big picture of ADHD. What do the policy people call this? This is an unintended effect or consequence. Nobody passed No Child Left Behind, whether you like the law or not. Nobody passed No Child Left Behind and said, we're gonna get those poor kids ADHD diagnoses. The law was intended to raise test scores. But many policies that are implemented have effects well beyond what the intended effects were because people, policymakers don't have crystal balls. So this is our review before we wrap up. Genes matter, early development matters, certainly families matter. The cultural values we place on schooling, test policies. Remember back to pharma, another reason for the explosion of ADHD diagnoses is more families are saying, gee, I saw it in Ladies Home Journal or on TV, the advertisement, maybe my kid has it too. Two more things. A big study we did at Berkeley, down at Irvine, many cities in the East Coast, some years ago, a big national treatment effort, a randomized trial. Medication, behavioral treatment, the two combined, or regular community care for nearly 600 kids with ADHD. The medications as delivered optimally were very good at reducing symptoms. But if the goal and the outcome measure on this slide is a combination of ADHD, aggressive, and depressive symptoms, school achievement, friendships on the play yard, and family, family practices getting more authoritative, the blue, the dark sort of blue-purple line is 
the families who participated randomly in the combination of well-delivered medicine and intensive behavioral treatment, their improvement was sharpest. If you really want to teach kids skills beyond controlling their symptoms, it's almost mandatory that you go beyond medications alone. And then finally, finally, I said I'd get back to this, diversion. That's the fancy term when you use someone else's medication and you don't have the condition. So why is there diversion of ADHD medications these days? Teenagers with ADHD hate taking the damn pills. I don't feel spontaneous, I don't feel creative. Last thing I'd want to do, don't want my friends to know, if you get into college, you might take, if you're really motivated, well, I've got my lecture classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but I'm not taking the damn stimulants Tuesday, Thursday. So there's a lot of pills in medicine cabinets, a lot of pills in apartments. It's about $5 a tab for Adderall now, some regions, according to local economy, more. And what do a lot of college kids know? If you take ADHD medication stimulants, you'll pull that all-nighter for the term paper due tomorrow or get that midterm studied for you haven't before. So there's a lot of controversy these days about are these meds really smart pills? It works for fluoride, maybe stimulants should be in the water supply. We'd be a more productive society. Works for caffeine for those of you who drink coffee, right? Well, I was asked a year ago almost to the day could give a talk up in Marin County. This is right north of San Francisco, very affluent. And the editors of the school papers had done confidential surveys the first month or two of school and found that 10% of all the ninth graders and 41% of the seniors admitted to taking other kids' stimulants. Not in college, in high school. So maybe it's a good idea, right? You're gonna get smarter. So Martha Farah, who'd written a psych bulletin paper that we accepted and published a couple years ago, with her team, Ilieva was the first author, did the first controlled trial of stimulants and placebos for college students without ADHD that was published in Neuropsychopharmacology last November. Seven week trial, you'd get medicine for a week, then placebo, 13 tests, not just of continuous performance, verbal fluency, working memory, long-term retention, serious tests of learning. Not every test was given every week, but over the seven weeks, they were able to say how many of those 13 measures of actual learning were improved on the stimulant weeks versus the placebo weeks. And the answer was zero. They added a 14th measure which was a single item rating scale, how well did you do on your test this week? And there was a huge effect. Because you can tell if you've had a stimulant versus placebo, your heart rate goes up, you get a little bit of a buzz. And the students who'd taken the medicine said, I aced them this week because I know I was on my medication. So a logical conclusion is that for the normal college population, stimulants are very good at boosting your false self-confidence in your learning, <laughs> but not your learning. Now, why is this a serious issue? If you have ADHD, you're likely to have a dopamine deficiency. We didn't review all the research. The medicines are actually replacing some dopaminergic flow that you don't usually have. And your learning goes up. If you don't have ADHD, your learning doesn't tend to go up very much. But what's the difference? Most people with ADHD don't get addicted to their stimulants they're taking if they've got good medical care. In fact, the rates are so low you can barely find them in the published literature. But if you are a regular, quote, college student taking stimulants as a smart pill, the rates of addiction are estimated to be 13 to 15 percent. And what does stimulant addiction look like? Two words, breaking bad, because it's the same stuff. Obviously, it's quicker and more addictive potential if you're snorting it or injecting it. But it's a mistake to think that we will become a smarter society and solve the college achievement problem by just making stimulants generally available. Because again, stimulant addiction is not a pretty sight. So I feel compelled to say that because, again, one of the consequences of two quick diagnoses and a lot of medications lying around that aren't well supervised is now and the estimates are 10%, 15, 20, 25, 30, 
a, a tenth to a third of college students admit to taking stimulants to help with study these days. And again, in high schools that are high performance, it, it might be just as high. So those are a few whirlwind tour observations about the ADHD explosion. I think, oh, I see, note cards are being passed around. So there's a way to ask questions without having to yell and scream. So what do we do next? Do we sit down and take some questions? Andy, is that what we should do? OK, great, let's do that. Thanks. And here's the thank you slide that I rushed across. Really appreciate being here. So let's turn this off and sit down. Thank you very much, Steve. As I was saying, it's not often that we get a talk that ranges all the way from genetics to public policy and really a, a, a wonderful, Thanks. wonderful range uh, that you're able to give us. Um, I've got a lot of questions that I'm going to be sorting through here while we speak. Uh, but one question that um, I certainly hear a fair amount from parents, and that's raised, I think, by some of the data that you show. Uh, well, addressed and raised both by the data that you show. That is, uh, medications help, yep. changing parenting style helps, uh, teaching kids coping skills helps. Uh, so often, uh, I hear parents say, well, you know, if we just try it harder, if we try to set a better example, if we try to exert more control in the home, if we try to teach our kids yeah. better coping strategies, they won't need medication. We can overcome yeah. the need for that. Um, your thoughts on how to help parents uh, grapple with that? It's a big issue. California, I think another factor we didn't talk about is there's probably more parents out here who natural treatments are better. Why would you medicate your kid, poison your kid? Becomes a philosophical issue. So how do, how do you deal with that? So. I would really like it if I could go into my reading on the computer later tonight or the textbook I'm editing tomorrow or the journal article and tell my eyes, if I just tried harder, I could read without reading glasses. But in fact, my eyes aren't very good at doing that. They're not that plastic these days. The brain's a more plastic organ than the optic system. Trying, if you have ADHD, helps, but it's really in some way swimming upstream. This isn't a condition or disorder of, I just didn't feel like it. Although the stereotype is it looks like you just didn't try very hard, or it looks like you didn't feel like it. There are, from all of the data I didn't talk about, scores of neuroimaging studies now showing that, for example, as you develop, and you have ADHD, your brain is about 5% smaller than comparison group brains. There are certain regions in the brain that don't develop as well, not only the frontal cortex as we talked about. The sending of messages across the white matter tracks from your frontal lobes deep within isn't as fast if you have ADHD. You're struggling with neurally based deficits that don't give you a neurological disorder, but it looks as though you don't care, you're not trying, or you're lazy or stupid. So the stigma is high. Medication, on the one hand, is rarely sufficient. Remember both of those kids in the Bay Area, for whom it was, most it's not. But the success rates are so high. And again, you say 80% of kids with ADHD respond to medication. It's about the same for adults. That doesn't mean it's night and day for most of those 80%. Sometimes it is. The teacher the next day said, what did you do, send an identical twin? with better behavior, but most of the time it's, yeah, effort's a little better, and those papers from ninth grade show up in the 11th grader's backpack two years later, magically, those assignments that were never turned in. Little things like that make a big difference. So it's hard to argue with a family who says, we'll never try medications for our kids. I think sometimes being calm, families in support groups, maybe it's worth a try because what we didn't talk about for medication is it's very likely that the first ADHD medicine you try won't work very well. And you've got to really work at getting the right dose. 
We've got tons of data over the years, labs at UCLA do, all around the world. If I could tell you, you bring your kid in for an assessment or you bring yourself in as an adult, I'd say, here's your history, here's your symptoms, you need methylphenidate, not dextroamphetamine, and you need this dose. If I could predict that, I would retire tomorrow and buy an island. There'd be a huge thing. We don't know how to do that yet. There's no known predictors. You've got to do trial and error and work hard with the doctor. That doesn't work in a 10-minute visit every six months. So getting a family to think about it and then getting a doctor on board who knows how to collect ratings from teachers. And this is where team efforts are involved. This is where UCLA Medical Center, UCSF, should be setting the standard for collaborating with school districts, getting paraprofessionals to observe kids. You can't do it in a single clinician's office. This is families, peers, and schools collaborating to get the best information possible to see if medication works. I mean, it's, it's like good cognitive therapy. You see if a new thinking strategy works and then try it out. Medicine may not work for you, but boy, it'd be great to give it a try as long as you combine it. So that was a long answer to an important question, but some families are not going to do it. So, and there's 20 or so percent of kids and adults with ADHD who either have side effects that are prohibitive or who don't respond very well at all, and then you have to go to other forms of treatment. Great. Thank Good. you. Uh, you know, you're talking about the kids who get medication doing better in school, the teacher saying, you know, have you sent another child here in place of that, the one who was here yesterday. Uh, we have a few questions about the other kinds of symptoms mm -hmm. and their responsiveness uh, to therapy. One question is about uh, injurious behavior and suicide attempts right. in girls. Does those, do those symptoms respond? Social acceptance right. in girls or boys. So what, what is the responsiveness of those things either to medication or to the other kinds of interventions that you're talking about. If you get a group of kids with ADHD and really get them the right dose and right kind of medication, on average, they won't be quite as rejected by their peer group because they're not doing some of those annoying things, but it doesn't increase their social acceptance because the medication doesn't teach you how to interact better and give you social skills. It really takes the behavioral, and if you're an adolescent or adult, cognitive behavioral skills training, sometimes in groups, to really teach you those skills. Now, in terms of self-injurious behavior, whether you've got ADHD or not, if you're a teen engaging in self-injurious behavior, stimulants are not going to generally help that. That might take an SSRI, it could take a mood-stabilizing medication. If the kid, however, has been on stimulants well delivered for a long time, what we think is it might cut down on their risk for self-injury later because it's going to prevent those feelings of despair and hopelessness and uh, sort of utter ennui because they're going to have a better skill base. So we don't know because we didn't in our girl sample, we didn't randomly assign some girls to get meds for 10 years and some not. We couldn't do that, obviously, ethically. So what we have, though, is records very regularly on who was taking medications. There's a hint that, even though it wasn't randomly assigned, so we don't know if the families with better insurance got medication, it's called selection factors, it seems that those girls who did get SSRI medications during their teen years showed lower rates of self-injury than those who didn't. And we don't have enough data on the other forms of therapy because, frankly, there aren't that many other than DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, many evidence-based treatments for kids who self-injure. So what we don't know about this still would fill a lot of libraries, but engagement and treatment is important. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, when um, I was in training, of course, the myth was that people grew out of ADHD. That's right. Uh, that it, it doesn't exist past childhood. That's right. Um, and we now know that it's one of those conditions that one at least doesn't necessarily have though. That's ever. right. Uh, one question here is what is the difference in symptoms between child and adolescent ADHD and adult ADHD? So if we'd had, and we could stay till midnight, I'm here, so we could do in our next session, I've got the slides that do the developmental tour. In the preschool years, it's a lot of impulsivity and the things I talked about before. In the grade school years, social, academic problems, accidental injury, 
And then what happens in middle school and high school? Two things, well, more than two, but the kids with the more purely inattentive style ADHD who maybe snuck by during childhood. They're bright, their family cared for them well, they had good teachers. Now this thing, this Waterloo called middle school hits. You have to know where your locker is. You have to t know that your algebra teacher writes assignments on the board and your history teacher sends them online and, oh, I even forgot that I had third period class, executive function organization takes over. So organization, 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 note taking in high school. These are the symptoms that get salient. And then, of course, adolescence, whether you've got ADHD or not, interesting things happen to your brain. You hit puberty. And through a complex series of events, hormones are released in droves throughout your body. Sex changes. Those same hormones circulate back, hit receptors in your brain, and what do those hormones tell the young adolescent brain to do? Take a lot of risks. This is why evolution created adolescence, right? I mean, you gotta take risks back in the day, which ever later now, to achieve independence. So the risk taking is upped at the same time that the frontal lobes aren't fully maturing until you're 23, 25, 27, and probably even later if you have ADHD. So this is the maturity gap. So driving problems. So part of self-injurious behavior is obviously extreme emotional distress, but part of it's impulsivity, the feeling that you can't get through this difficult emotion unless you see the blood ooze or feel the physical pain. So the, I mean, when do most kids get referred for ADHD? Second, third, fourth grade, academic, social problems. But in adolescence, organization, impulsivity, and why did I learn three decades ago that ADHD vanishes with puberty? Because in most kids with ADHD, they're not running around the classroom. They can sit at 18. We had boys, especially at our summer camps, we have videotapes from opening day, where we do opening day, everybody on placebo. You can't believe what running across tables, utter chaos. Those same kids 10 years later will sit still with a one-on-one -on -one with an adult for an hour or two, but they'll tell you, my mind is racing. The physical restlessness transmogrifies into a sort of mental restlessness. So little wonder the clinicians back then said, well, it looks like it goes away. A lot of the symptoms recede, but the executive function problems, the organizational problems, and the real inability to focus attention when you most need to, those things don't go away. Right? Well, I mean, you raise, uh, I think, a really interesting question about trajectories here. That is, uh, there's risk taking, some kids get into substance use and abuse, some get into criminal behavior, yeah. uh, the risk of accidental death. I mean, there, there are lots of risks. At the same time, a lot of kids with ADHD are enormously bright. That's right. Uh, very high achieving. Um, as much as some of them can be annoying, some of them are enormously socially engaging. That's right. And can end up um, very, very highly successful. In your longitudinal work, Steve, have you seen, or, or do you have theories on predictors of who's going to do well and end up being one of those very high achieving, successful individuals, um, somebody, and somebody who's less successful, right. and what some of the early hallmarks might be there? Well, in our own research on following up about a thousand kids, we have tried, and maybe we haven't gone far enough into adulthood yet, which is why we're continuing to do this work, we haven't found yet a coherent set of childhood predictors or adolescent mediators of the resilient subgroup. We know they exist. But it seems as though each case is in some ways its own unique case. For a lot of people with ADHD, it's getting out of school. Because you don't have a teacher telling you what to do. But if you've never really gained many skills in school, getting out of school reduces the symptoms, but it doesn't really predict a great future. A lot of people with ADHD who are bright and skilled are entrepreneurs. A lot of people in our sample in the Bay Area are restaurant people. They're creatively working. Now, it took a lot of them getting assistance. They're not usually rich enough to have a personal assistant, 
but to get organized enough to get the training to get those kinds of jobs. So again, if ADHD is a gift, it's, that bow was wrapped pretty tight on that gift. You don't want to foretell doom and say, everybody with ADHD is going to have a terrible life. Many people do well. And we have testimonials. CEOs of major firms disclose their ADHD. They don't disclose that they have 10 personal assistants, right? <laughs> they don't disclose that the way the CEO of JetBlue years ago, before he got fired, got fired because of some impulsive decision making, right? So along with the curse, there's blessing. Along with the blessing, there's curse. And one thing we do know is that when you're a kid with ADHD, we don't tend to really use you that much in the assessment process. We talk to your parents and teachers. So the kids will say, I'm doing fine. My teacher sucks and my friends hate me because they're all screwed up. And, <laughs> right? They're, they're externalizing it. Over time, self-awareness grows. But self-awareness isn't, it's, it's late in the game to catch up. So what you want to do is help people, and on another tangent here, Maybe if we just had a different educational system that really took into account the unique trajectories and pathways and skills of every kid, we wouldn't have ADHD. Well, we could have open classrooms, open schooling, the stuff I read about as an undergraduate all those years ago. Open classrooms, everybody looks like they have ADHD because everybody's milling around, no one's ever asked to sit. The problem is open classrooms don't help many kids with ADHD learn. Paradoxically, structure along with warmth makes the symptoms salient, but over time, if the kids internalize, they do better. So it's, I think, the teacher who gets some of the quirkiness, some of the out-of-box thinking and innovativeness, but helps the kid get socialized too. So the short answer is family background, socioeconomic status, how severe the symptoms were when you were a kid, all of those are predictors. But we really don't have the right magic of what's predicting the ones who do really well. We know they exist, but it seems to be individually wrapped packages so far. Okay. Right, thank you. you know, uh, changing gears a little bit, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the questions I have here about treatments and different specific forms of treatment time, I'm not going to go into a, a number of these, because as I tell my own patients, if you get it in the checkout line at Trader Joe's, it probably is not treatment. That's right. Um, but there are a few that mm -hmm. um, I think are, are worth particularly bringing up. And one of them, that uh, being an EEG researcher myself, That's I right. get a fair amount of, is neurofeedback and EEG right. neurofeedback in particular. What are, you, what, what are your thoughts on this? It's very popular. It is done a lot in the community. It's uh, very intuitive. You're going to teach the kid to self-regulate his or her own brain waves. Right? What could be better? So the very short version, and I don't mean to go so quick, I'm, I'm, I'm doing damage to a potentially vi viable and valuable treatment modality is. So we know there's different sorts of electrical signals your brain sends out from various regions, and some of those waves are associated with daydreaming, and some of them are associated with focus. So you sit yourself in front of a computer, except now you have an electrode cap on, and there's wires that feed into the computer. And sometimes with guidance, sometimes more naturally, the clinician says, I see we're doing work, or you're thinking about things. Oh, look, the screen's turning a nice green color, not a harsh red, or the stars are lighting up on the screen. Your brain is starting to focus. Keep doing that, right? So you're training your brain, essentially, to create the brain waves that are associated with optimal focus. So this has been touted a lot. Until very recently, there haven't been many really good control group studies. Some recent studies show there's some real promise here. The catch is, does your focus when you're sitting there in the office generalize next week to homework or next month to the soccer field? The problem with most any ADHD treatments we've ever had is they don't tend to maintain over time. So there's a big trial going on back in the Midwest and East right now that should provide some answers. And this will be a few hundred kids in this trial. But it's interesting because 
of the design. So there's the neurofeedback group, there's the extended waiting list group, and then there's the third group that comes in, gets the skull caps on, the electrodes are led into the computer, and they get feedback, but the feedback isn't exactly their own brain waves at that time. It's false. And initial data are not very convincing that the real neurofeedback is doing terribly much better than the false neurofeedback, because there's a lot of expectation. Right? There's biofeedback for a lot of medical conditions back in the day. I'm hooked up to a machine, it's gonna make me better. So what we don't know is, and I think the real answer here, there's gonna be a subgroup of kids, teens, and adults with ADHD who are very good responders to neurofeedback, but it's not gonna be a standalone treatment. It's probably gonna be some people added with medication, many people teaching academic and social skills, but for some it may be a godsend, but we don't have the definitive data yet. Thank okay. you. That's very helpful. Uh, there are a few questions about some uh, alternative treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, one question here about uh, music therapy programs, mm -hmm. others about meditation, wow. mindfulness. Uh, what, what's the evidence base like for those these days? There's very little evidence base for music therapy, although it's intuitive and a great idea. In terms of mindfulness, of course, Dr. Smalley right here at Semmel and others have done some initial trials. The question again is, does the state of mindfulness you get into last beyond the meditation session and can it generalize? It's a high bar for people with ADHD. Some really interesting work being done back on the East Coast with a couple of people I know trying to embed mindfulness practices into parent training for, pe for the families of kids with ADHD. Because if you think about what the parent has to do, it's not just the refrigerator chart, it's the accepting that your kid is a little different or quirky or not gonna fit in a classroom as well, not getting bent out of shape with every rule infraction, because if you do, everybody's bent out of shape permanently. And so teaching skills when there's skills to be taught, but also some acceptance and some rolling with it and getting into the flow of it. So I think in some ways, the best use of mindfulness in the next few years may be to embed some of those principles for family members of people with ADHD to embed them into parent management. Okay. Great, thank you. I keep looking out for your questions, but I keep forgetting that Andy's got the questions here, so. <laughs> That's right. Um, we actually, and I have a lot of them, but we're gonna start wrapping up very soon. Your talk about families, mm -hmm. um, I, I think raises a very interesting question. You're, a lot of what you were talking about was working with the family, through the family, yeah. to help the child with ADHD. But you have a very interesting family compound, don't you, here? That mm -hmm. is, because of the high heritability, there's a right. decent chance that uh, the mother or the father has ADHD. Whether diagnosed or not, right. Whether diagnosed or not. And uh, the child's having problems in school. And, and some of the questions were along these lines as well, that well, what if a parent identifies a lot with a child with ADHD? That is, a child comes home, there's a report saying, you know, uh, your son is doing X, Y, or Z. Right. One parent says, that seems perfectly normal to me. And uh, the other parent says, why? Well, yes, yes, dads out there, right? We hear this a lot. Mom is super concerned, and the dad says, he's just like I was back at the time. He'll be fine. Oh, will he, right? So, and sometimes it's the reverse. So, we know that from our studies of peer relationships, and we do these summer programs, half the kids have ADHD, half don't. So we can look to see not just who receives the negative peer approval, but who gives it. Kids with ADHD are kind of forgiving. They tend to think, God damn it, he's just like me, he's kind of cool. Or she's living on the edge. But even other kids with ADHD fairly intensely dislike a lot of those behaviors. Parents might identify, boy, I had those problems, they were never diagnosed, I was creative, I was original. But when it's your kid getting the bad scores on the report card or disrupting at home, that forgiveness only goes so far.
And I think what happens is, well, they're sort of birds of a feather, there's some perceived similarity, but they're doing stuff that's annoying, and so the parents get inconsistent. They cut a lot of slack because the kid's just like me, and then the kid crosses the line, and there's a harsh yelling punishment, and nobody wins. The point is to be more even keeled. Again, if you're going to do parent management to work with families of kids with ADHD, you're trying to help parents be super parents, but not to be their Ozzie and Harriet style every minute. It's to have things more regular. There's house rules. And if you violate the rules, there'll be a consequence, not a screaming match. Pre-plan it. It's like the family needs executive function. And then the kid has a more regular, expectable environment, and you don't get into this contention that is way too much part of the game. Even for kids with the more purely inattentive form, well, they're not disruptive. Why would families argue because the kid can't sit still at dinner, because the kid never finishes homework, and the report card has everything from A's to F's on it? It's frustrating to families, maybe even particularly for families who identify because they're confused. Okay. Sure. Um, I appreciate your offer to go till midnight, mm -hmm. but, oh, but I got to get home. Okay. Um, and besides, even more importantly than that, I know a lot of people in the audience are going to want to get to the foyer and Good. talk to you and, and have you uh, sign their book. So first, let me thank you very much for making the trip. Thank you. It's it's always good to have a brilliant return home. That's right. So um, thank you so much for coming down and for a talk that was a real tour de force. It was just a wonderful presentation. I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening um, and uh, for participating in not just this, but other programs here as well. And uh, just to reiterate Vicki's call, we're looking for new friends of the friends. So if you're not a friend of the friends yet, please pick up an envelope in the foyer. So. Uh, you can support more programs like this, more friend scholars like Tara and others in her cohort. We'd love to have you see you at this event um, and our gala coming up on April 19th next year. So thanks again. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you in the foyer.